in John 3, 16 through 18. For God loved the world in this way. He gave his one and only son so that everyone who believes in him will not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. Anyone who believes in him is not condemned, but anyone who does not believe is already condemned because he has not believed in the name of the one and only Son of God. April, what you got? Can you hear me now? Yep. Yes. Okay, so I have two, is that okay? Yes. Um, 50, one through three. The mighty one, God the Lord speaks. He summons the earth from the rising of the sun to its setting. From Zion, the perfection of beauty, God appears in radiance. Our God is coming. He will not be silent. That's good. That's Thank you, April. All right, Glennis, you got a verse? Well, she got another one, right? There's one more. Oh, there's two, two, not just yes. the same. Well, there was four, but I narrowed it to two. Okay. We, um, okay. Hebrews 12, three through six. For consider him who endured such hostility from sinners against himself, so that you won't grow weary and give up. And struggling against sin, you have not yet resisted to the point of shedding your blood, and you have not you have forgotten the exhortation that addresses you as sons. My son, do not take the Lord's discipline lightly, or lose heart when you are reproved by him, for the Lord disciplines the one he loves and punishes every son he receives. Yeah. Thank you. All right, Glennis, okay. please share. All right, I got James chapter one, verses two through four. Um, consider it all joy, my brethren, when you encounter various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces endurance. And let endurance have its perfect results so that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. Good. Thanks. Hey, Paul. All right. Well, this is really easy for us to do, do in the midst of a pandemic. So this kind of came to me today. Uh, this is Exodus 20. Verse four, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days you, you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. On it you shall not do any work, you or your son or your daughter, your male servant or your female servant, or your livestock or the sojourner who is within your gates. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea and all that is in them, and rested on the seventh day. Therefore, the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy. That's convicting. That's good truth. Say it's easy to get away from that right now in a pandemic when we're not going to church, when we don't yeah. actually have a place to go to just watch a quick sermon and then get on with our day. Yeah, and just all your days blend. Like, what day is it? You know? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, wait, wait. You kind of lose that rhythm. It's good. All right, Sharon, do you please share your verse? Jude 1, 20 and 21. But you, dear friends, must build each other up in your most holy faith. Pray in the power of the Holy Spirit and await the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ, who will bring you eternal life. In this way, you will keep yourself safe in God's love. Everything for there was. 
was anything You saw it all You are God Almighty And you rule supremely For we know the world began At the sound of your command For all inspiring There is no denying All the wonders you have made Universe displays how great you are. Wonderful in your majesty, powerful in your sovereignty, wonderful in your majesty, powerful. Your sovereignty. You have all authority, and your glory will never fade away. You are God Almighty, and you rule supremely, for we know the world began. At the sound of your command, you are all inspiring. There is no denying all the wonders you have made. Universe displays, you are God Almighty, and you rule supremely. For we know the world began at the sound of your command. You are all inspiring. There is no denying all the wonders you have made. And the universe displays how great you are. For God so loved the world. See, God was there in the very beginning of time. Before there was even time, there was God, and God created the world, and it was good, because God is good. And so he loved the world. He loved us so much. So in the very beginning, there was God, and he created us with his own hands and his own image. He breathed the breath of life into us, and we became alive. So in the beginning, it was good. Because God is good, and God makes things good. But if you look around too long, it doesn't take long to figure out it's not so good anymore. So what happened? When we had creator and creation and a perfect celebration, a communion, but then sin stepped in. Sin separated us from Him. So what in the world will God do? Will God provide a way? Will God give us a rescuer? What will God do with the problem of sin? So for God so loved the world, He gave his one and only son. Will you believe? Let's do something risky here. Risky business sermon. We're going to approach the familiar. And the risk is that you'll tune me out. You go, oh, pastor, really? John 3.16? You couldn't come up with something a little more intriguing than that? But we stick to the familiar. Know the familiar. The Bible in a nutshell right here in John 3.16. Even and especially if you memorized it as a kid, you go, I know the words. Are we living the words? Are we teaching the words? Don't forget the familiar just because it's familiar. We watch reruns of shows and movies again, and we like, well, you see new things, or some things are just comforting to know them again. Some things are inspiring because you go, oh, I didn't see that before. Open my eyes to those things. I love to kiss my wife after 20 plus years of kissing the same lips. I still love to kiss those lips, even though it's familiar, especially when it's familiar. My wife makes chocolate chip cookies. And I go, oh, I had your cookies before. I don't need these. No, I delight in them. So hope that we would delight in God's word today. If you've got a copy of God's word, open it up to the gospel of John. 
Now, one of the reasons it's also so important for us to know the word so much that like we just we just speak it like it's 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 it comes as naturally as breathing is because it is breathed. The scriptures are described as a God breathed word, the living word of God. The only other thing in the Bible that's described as God breathed us, that breath you took. God gave us the breath. So the word of God and us, the children of God, both God breathed. So we should know it as naturally as breathing in, breathing out. Because true story, one time I absolutely froze. I got stage fright. I choked. I could not quote John 3.16. Want to hear a story about it? Here's how it goes. I'm in college and I'm a part of InterVarsity Christian Fellowship at UTSA. And I'm making this like huge six foot by 10 foot banner and this big banner paper is going to hang in the hallways of UTSA, you know, promoting things we're doing in the ministry. And, and on it, I was cutting out letters, you know, one by one, big, long, crafty project, the words for John 3, 16, for God so loved the world he gave. And I got that about that far. I was creating this banner in the kitchen of my parents' house. We had a house guest at that time. Uh, he was uh, grown up Jewish, Jewish family, Jewish descent. He believed in the God of the Old Testament, not Jesus at all. And so he doesn't know John 3, 16. And so he's looking over my shoulder going, hey, what you doing there? What's that going to say? And I was like, uh, but, uh, but, uh, but, uh, God, God, God loved the world so much. And, um, yeah. And I remember my mom was even in the kitchen. I'm so embarrassed. I froze. I was nervous. I was tongue-tied. I could not get the words out. So by God's grace, God uses, you know, people who stutter, people who get tongue-tied, people like me, people that are shy and would, would, would rather just kind of, you know, withdraw and stay in the back. And, you know, um, in some ways, I'm, I'm even more bold, I think, preaching to a camera, looking at a red light. But, you know, guess what? By next week, we'll get to gather again. Some of you guys will stay home because that's wise. Some of you guys, you know, will come gather together in person. I'll have to look you in the eyes. I won't be looking at a red light of a camera anymore. So, you don't have to put on a red light. Sorry, that was bonus. Now, now we go into the Gospel of John, but before we do, let's kind of backtrack and look where we've been. So we started in the book of Matthew. The Gospels are, are in order of Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. The Synoptic Gospels is what Matthew, Mark, and Luke are called. That's where we've been. And Matthew focuses on Jesus as the King, the King of Kings, promised King. There was a kingdom established, and this promise of one day there would be a king from the line of David. So Matthew's Gospel has a genealogy, and it traces it back to David so that we would know this king comes from King David, and that line that was promised, that promise fulfilled. Then in the Gospel of Luke, um, I mean Mark, Matthew, Mark, Mark's gospel, we see that Jesus, the primary theme for him is like he's a servant. He serves. He's a man of action. So there is no genealogy in the gospel of Mark. It's just like, just get to work. You don't need to know where he came from. Just know what he's doing. Then in Luke that we talked about last week, focuses on Jesus as a man. Like God brought him into the world. So it traces his genealogy, goes all the way back to the beginning, the very first man. And now in the book of John, and John's a little different than the other Gospels. John is just blatant, screaming, bold, articulate, listen, Jesus is the Son of God. So does it have a genealogy? Not really. It says it like this in John 1, 1. It says, in the beginning was the Word, capital W, Word. So it's describing Jesus there. And the Word was with God, and the Word was God. So we have Father, Son, Holy Spirit. So it's tracing the genealogy really back to know that Jesus was there in the beginning. It's not like there's Old Testament God, and he's a God of wrath, and he's mad, and then Jesus came on the scene, and he's got, you know, feathered hair and product. He's a little nicer. He's a little you know, easier on the eyes and easier to handle. You can bring him home to Mama for dinner. He's, he's the calm God. No, no, no. Same Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Jesus was there in the beginning, in the creation. He was there during you know, moments of wrath and flooding the world. He was there. So that's where Jesus is. Jesus is the Son of God. This is what the Gospel of John is going to proclaim as loud and as clear as it can. So in the, in the scope of clarity 
and brevity. I don't think there's a better place than John 3, 6, it's like the Bible in a, in a tweetable format, right? On Twitter, you get like 280 characters, right? Like you can easily put John 3.16 in there. So let's read it, but I want to go a little beyond. I want to have John 3.16 through 18. For God loved the world in this way. He gave his one and only son, so everyone who believes in him will not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. Anyone who believes in him is not condemned, but anyone who does not believe is already condemned, because he has not believed in the name of the one and only son of God. So let's break those verses down a little bit. Don't make me break this down for nothing. When we look at John 3.16, we know that God loved. Who? The world. Are you in the world? Yes. Then you are included in that love. How does he love the world? What way does he love the world? Let me share it by a like, way of an example as a dad myself. Now that I'm a dad, uh, I've got children. When my sons were young, we used to have this kind of railing, this banister, you know, little, little rails, just big enough that my son Samuel could get his head in, and it kind of got down. You know, those, those, those pillars kind of taper sometimes. He got his head down in the pillars, and now he's just stuck. Stuck! Stuck! And any good mom or dad, they know the different cries of their children. So you can kind of hear like, oh, they's just whining, or he just wants something, or maybe they're hungry, or maybe they're really hurt. I heard, I heard the sound of Samuel really scared and stuck. Now, the, 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 the pillar of fatherhood that I am um, was not so quick to respond. And maybe we are like that sometimes. You ever seen like been like a lazy dad who's like, man, I'm already in the full reclined position. Is this really going to require me getting up? Hey, can you get yourself unstuck? Try it on your own. Maybe you give instructions from the couch or you try to show them, teach them with however you can, but you don't want to move because, you know, then you have to get up. You have to get into action. You might have to get dirty a little bit. So thinking about God and God loves us. Each and every one of us, we had our heads stuck in the banister of sin. We were stuck and we needed help from a heavenly father, someone that could lend a hand. What did God do? Just recline on the clouds in heaven, but hey, fix it yourself. You got yourself into this mess, get yourself out. No, because God loved. For God so loved the world in this way. What way? He steps into action. He steps into the scene and he's the one that we want to see. Christ is moving here. He steps into the mess that we had made because of our sin. For God so loved the world, he gave. Think about you can tell a lot about a person by the gifts they give. Like if someone gives you a gift for your birthday or for Christmas and it's really not a gift that you would ever even want, you're like, apparently you do not know me very well. You gave me a gift that I don't want. God knows exactly what we need as he gives and God's a giver. God is a gracious, gracious giver. So think about some of like the greatest gifts that you've been given though. For the people that know you well, one of the best first gifts I remember ever getting was my first dog, Sam. I got a Cocker Spaniel on my fifth birthday party. My face just lit up in joy, appreciation to my parents because every great gift demands a great response. So we had a party when I got my first dog that I've been wanting forever. Or then I think about maybe one of the best gifts I've ever given was, was a day that I, um, I, I got down on a knee and I gave a diamond ring to my girlfriend that that day became my fiance who is now my wife and she's still wearing that ring and if she would have received that gift and gone, eh, could have done better or eh, I might put it on, I might wear it. Think of how crushed I would be because every great gift demands a great response or like, so my wife for me on our, our wedding, she gave me a guitar, this guitar, this old Gill. I love this guitar still. I've had it for 20 plus years and I keep it in a prominent position. I make sure that I get to play it still. It's a good, good gift. But imagine if my wife gave me that gift and I was like, eh, all right, thanks. <laughs> no, 
every great gift demands a great response. So if God on high in heaven gives us his son, his only begotten son, his one and only son, the King of kings and Lord of lords, the one who came to serve and not to be served. He gave us God in flesh as a man, his son. That's the greatest gift the world has ever received. What is our response? For God so loved the world. He gave. Gave his only son. So what? So that everyone who believes, everyone who believes, let's focus on that first word, everyone. Everyone. That's the whosoever's. You're one of those whosoever's. You're part of the everyone. Everyone is invited to believe, and everyone gets into eternal life in the same way. That's why Christianity, as God has formed it, is one of the most inclusive opportunities Religions, if you want to call it that, even though it's more of a relationship, everyone gets into the relationship the same way. And everyone is invited. What's everyone invited to do? Here's, here's an action. Here's an action word. Here's a verb. Believes. We must believe. And by way of an analogy, thinking about belief. What do you believe? I would, I would hope that I could believe that this little step... This little step kind of stand, I would believe that it could hold my weight. Huh. Well, how do I prove it could hold my weight? How do I believe that it will hold me? Well, how about I just how about I just say it? How about I just say, you know what? I'm pretty sure this thing's sturdy enough. This thing would hold my weight. I believe it would hold me. That's his lip service. Is that enough? Is that believing? What about if I tell others, hey, guess what? Man, this thing will hold you. You can believe in it. This step will hold you. And you tell others, hey, y'all, listen. Listen up. This will hold you. Good step right here. Is that believing? What if you what if you like, no, oh, I'm gonna I wanna get artistic about this thing and I wanna I'll paint it up and I'll sand it nice, I'll polish it up so it looks real pretty for everyone, and then as it looks real pretty, I'll sing songs about it like I believe I can step on this. I believe it will hold my weight. Is that believing? Or maybe you just be real affectionate. You just want to hug it. Oh, I hug the step. I believe it will hold me. I'm in love with the step. And I, is that believing that it will hold you? Do you see how insane this is getting? I'm not even done yet. What if you get like get a little nerdy on it? Like, well, let me tell you the specifics of this. You know, this is a cedar wood, and cedar wood is a good type of wood. It's lightweight, not necessarily as durable as an oak, but it would still hold a man easily of 200 pounds plus. And, you know, this is constructed pretty well. It's got wood screws and all these angles, and, you know, we get real nerdy about it and go into the, go into the specifics and, you know, just break it down. And, you know, I believe scientifically this should be able to hold you. Is that believing? What about if you go into history? Like, I know the history of this step. I saw my dad make this step back in 1985. And, you know, I saw my dad himself step on this step. It's true. Saw it with my eyes. I know the history. And since this step held my daddy, I believe this step would hold me too. Is that believing? What about, what about if, you, if you're like, I'll oh, Captain Morgan on this thing. What if, like, I just kind of prop one foot on it? You know what? I think that would hold me. I'm just going to kind of lean here on it, kind of strike a pose right here on it. Go, I believe that would hold me. Is this believing? I don't think so. I think this is what we too often do. We're like, I'm going to kind of put one foot into church, one foot into God's world, one foot into whatever God wants. God's will be done as long as I can keep most of my weight firmly planted on my own strength, my own will, my own trust in myself. This is not believing. For God so loved the world, he gave his son, whoever believes. How in the world are we going to show that we believe the step will hold us other than I'm going to take a step on the step. And now on Christ the solid rock I stand. Everything else won't hold me. Now I believe, this is belief, that this will hold me. So in the same way, in our faith, if we believe, then we will trust that he will hold us. And not just Jesus and. Like so often, I believe Jesus and. 
and a good job so I have enough money, or I believe Jesus and, and you fill in all the things that might bring pleasure, or Jesus and, I want to cover the bases and at least know the other gods and the other religions. Has he left us that option? Not if you keep reading John 3.16. Everyone who believes in, what's the next word? Him. So this is not a vague belief about believing. Especially, especially around Christmas time. All the movies and the signs and the songs are just, they're about believe. Just, just believe. Just believe. Just believe in your heart. You believe and believe. Have faith. Believe. And if you just leave it at that, that's pretty vague. How far does it go? Not far enough. Because Christ was very, very specific. And the gospel says we believe in him. Who him? Jesus Christ, the king, the servant, the man, the son of God. This is who we believe. And part of my greatest fear for our world today are the prodigals and like the nomads who know this verse by heart. They were part of the church and they've gone off in their own little ways because maybe church let them down, maybe they were judged, maybe they were hurt, maybe there was a, a, a tragic moment in their life and they thought, surely a loving God wouldn't let this happen. Well, loving God gave His Son into the world so that anyone who believes in Him, Him specifically, and this is what I worry about, like I say, that the prodigals have gone off or like the nomads are just doing their own thing and kind of cruising around a bunch of different religions or no religion. How do you get around Jesus? Like, I can understand in a lot of ways how someone might bail on church. Like, I'm part of a church. I, I lead a church. I'm a pastor of a church. I like to, um, as many times as I can, to as many people as I can, have conversations about church. I believe that God still loves His church. It's His bride, even though she is flawed. I recently had a conversation with, with somebody. I was on the trails. I was riding my bike and had a, a conversation with a uh, a young black college student, and they were saying, you know what? I miss church. <laughs> and I love that. Just the, they hadn't been in church in a while. So, you know, they went to a black church and said, I love my church. And like, church would be long. And the, and the church ladies had their hats. And she starts to talk about all the things she missed about church. But way too often, we just kind of, church is a take it or leave it. And I'm hoping that as we come out of pandemic, that we'll come back into church in a strong way in our gathering together as it is safe. And the church being a movement of Christ where we show our love for him and our love for each other. That, that church that Jesus says, man, the gates of hell can't even stand against it. But way too often, we just see on the surface level, you know, the church hurt me. I don't like their style there. That pastor doesn't seem genuine. Or, you know, my ex goes to that church, so I can... So, way too often, we bail on church, and I can understand that to a certain degree, but I hope you'll come back. My bigger question, my biggest concern is, like, what do you do with Jesus? Like, if, if you tasted and saw that the Lord is good the way the Scripture says, I mean, you said a prayer, you started to believe, or you started to walk a path with Christ, and then you're like, yeah, I'm going to kind of just go the nomad direction. I'm going to have no religion. What do you do with Jesus? Especially when you kind of think, well, maybe he's just one of the paths to God. God is, God's kind of vague, and God is spirit, and so you pick your own path. You go, you go up this side of the hill by Buddhism, or you come up this way by Mormonism, or you just be good. You just be you, and just don't hurt nobody. You get up the hill on your own way, and, and you go ahead and take Jesus. That's a good option. Jesus has not left us that option, because we keep going through the Gospel of John. Go to John 14, 6. John chapter 14, verse 6, Jesus says, he's telling his disciples he's about to go, and they're going, hey, where are you going? And Jesus answered them, I am the way and the truth and the life. And now, as we as Christians, if we, wanted to, if we wanted to make much more friends and get invited to more parties, if we just changed just a little bitty bit of that verse, if we just said that Jesus said, you know, I, I am a way, I'm a truth, I'm a life. I could get invited to way more parties. You could too. If you just manipulated the scriptures a little bit, you would offend less people, but you would greatly offend a great creator God. So let's go with the truth of what Jesus said. John 14, 6. I am the way, the truth, the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. So there's the who, who is the him? 
Whosoever believes in him is Christ, the only way, the way to truth and life, and he loves us. He loves us so much that he would have us not to perish. We will not perish, but have eternal life. And what if in the midst of a pandemic that we're in, what if in the midst of your pain right now, what if in the midst of your past pain or future pain, what if in the midst of all that, God is doing something so that we might not perish? Hasn't God used pain to get our attention sometimes when we were on a path that was leading to destruction? It was leading to perishing. It was leading us away from Him. And God says, no, no, come back. I am the way. Don't go that way. Don't go away. Come back to the way. And God will use pain to get our attention at times. So in the midst of a pandemic, what if God is saving us from something worse? You're like, what's worse? There's people dying and hospitals are full. And some people don't even believe the pandemic is a real thing and the whole thing's a hoax. So there's division there and headbutts there. And that person won't wear a mask. So there's fights over there. And then, oh man, there's racism right there. So there's all kinds of headbuttings. What a year 2020. Could it be that God could and would and will use all that's going on in order to get our attention in ways that we would recognize it might get worse? But what if God uses even worse to save us from the absolute worst? What's the absolute worst thing that could happen to you or me? Like, oh, I guess I could die a painful death. I wouldn't even say that's the worst thing that could happen to you or to happen to me. The absolute worst thing that could happen to you or to me is that we would perish apart from God. That we would be before the throne of heaven and we start to say, Hey God, remember I, I memorized John 3.16. Want to hear it? Here it goes. And you tell him about the things you did in his name. And God would say, Away from me, I never knew you. I believe that is the worst thing that can happen to any of us. For a creator God to look on one of his creation, his creation that said no to him repeatedly, so much to the point where he goes, I don't know him. I created him. I created her. But they were not adopted into my family through my son that I gave. That's the worst thing. To perish apart from him. So whatever God would use in our lives that would draw our attention to him, I hope that we would be willing to receive those things. Not to curse him, not to turn our back on him, but to trust him. Because in him is eternal life close with that thought on eternal life. Friends, brothers and sisters, would you lift your head up out of the day-to-day -day and the regular things that the muck and the mire and just some things that aren't even bad, they're just busy. If Satan can't make you bad, he just makes you busy and you're just stuck in the present day. You can't even think about tomorrow. You can't even think about next week. So how in the world are you going to think about eternity? Because I mean, that's vague. But God has placed eternity in our hearts. So if we would set our minds on eternity, not perishing, but having eternal life, God gives life and life abundant. But we need his help, so let's ask him for it. Let's pray together. So let's just have a prayerful reflection on John 3.16. Let's think on these words. God gave. What has God given to you? Thank God for what he's given to you. Believe. What do you believe? Thank God for the belief. the belief that he is good and he loves you. And perish. What areas of your life are perishing right now? Ask God to save you from those areas. To save you from yourself. To save you from the evil one to save you from the accuser, the tempter. Everlasting life. What do you do each day to experience God? 
What do you do every day to experience God's everlasting life? It doesn't start when you pass away from this world. It starts right now. And finally, pray on this. With whom can you share the truth of John 3.16 this week? Ask for God's help to be bold and faithful in sharing the truth of His good news, of His great love. So Father in heaven, thank you that we have hope. Hope like an anchor, firm and secure. Hope because of the truth that you love us, you love your world. You gave your son. So we believe, we believe in you. We thank you for eternal life with you. Help us to share this good news with others. Through Christ we pray, amen.
I like sawdust. At least, at least my hands like sawdust. Not so much in my respiratory system, certainly not in my eyes. That's why if I'm gonna cut some wood and make some sawdust, I wanna protect my eyes. Now the same way many of us, different, different approaches to the COVID pandemic. Some of us are more like hands. You know, we're healthy, we're younger, we're not as susceptible to the virus, and if we got it, we would probably be all right. You're more like sawdust in the hands. Others are more like sawdust in the eyes, either by age or just by the way your body is made up. Maybe you have asthma like my wife and sons who are not gonna be back in church when the doors are open because sawdust to the eyes is bad. COVID to the person with breathing related illnesses or they're, they're older and they're more susceptible, COVID is incredibly dangerous. So we wanna take those precautions. We wanna to continue to worship online. Uh, our quality and our availability on online platforms will even increase in these days. We're getting better and better at being a church online. And so I want you to shelter in place, stay home, worship with us. If, if you're more like, man, sawdust in my eye, bad. COVID in my life would be detrimental and maybe even deadly. So please, please continue to take precautions as we begin to meet together again in person, don't feel like anyone will judge you as being less spiritual or less godly because you're not there every time the church doors are open. Others are really ready, so please don't judge them for being ready and wanting to gather together again, wanting to get together and just get moving. It just feels like they've been stuck in place and the way God's hardwired them, they just need to meet. And so when we meet, we're gonna take the precautions. We're gonna wear our masks as much as possible and we're gonna take stay six feet apart. Now, we're all judges, right, when we're seeing people gathering going, they're not six feet apart. So let me give you a good example when you're measuring distance and kind of thinking, how far is six feet? Well, I am six foot three. So by my trusty cutout of myself, if there to here, that's six feet. Six feet apart is like one shad length away. So as we gather, think to yourselves, Am I one six foot pastor shad linked from the person I am talking to and interacting with? And then uh, I hope that God would just bless us as we gather, that we're being uh, wise and discerning, being lifting up prayers for our city and for our leaders, especially those who are planning and going back to school. It feels like so many times every decision we make, it's like you're making a move on a chessboard and then someone just knocks the chessboard over as soon as you make that move. So a popular word these days is pivot. Like everything's about pivot and being fluid and being flexible. So thank you, church, that you are continuing to be steadfast in your worship and your prayers and your giving as we pivot through this season, knowing that God doesn't change. God is in control. God does indeed have plans for his church, and we're praying that God would reveal his will to us. We know that he has not changed his will when he says that we should love him and love each other. So let us love God, love each other, and serve with humility. All right, peace. Let's talk about prayer. We have to pray just to make it today. Yeah, that's MC Hammer. Let's go Leonard Ravenhill because he's even better. Leonard Ravenhill says, the pastor who is not praying is playing and the people who are not praying are straying. So here's three ways coming up we can be in better, deeper prayer together. One, every Wednesday on Zoom, 6 p.m., we're praying together. So join me on Zoom. If you don't know Zoom yet, you can you know, Google it, look on YouTube, you know, how do you do Zoom? It's an easy, free platform that we can video chat together from our own homes together. So every Wednesday, 6 p.m., we'll just share a scripture and then just pray what that scripture is saying. So let's be in prayer together on Wednesdays. And then there's another opportunity on a Saturday coming up. Saturday, August 1st, um, we're going to join together and bless our neighborhood, our community as best as we can. That we would have a drive through prayer opportunity so that anyone driving by our church would see we've got the tents out, we've got the signs up going, how can we pray for you? And so we need people that would be willing to pray for our neighbors, do a, a appropriate, healthy social distancing, wearing masks in a way that don't put anyone at risk. But we want to be able to offer prayers up for our neighbors. So that's August 1st. Another great opportunity is coming up August 9th and August 16th, just as a city that we would be a part of it. And check out this video to learn more about that. Let's pray, shall we? Let's come together as a community and talk to God. Let's ask Him to help us. To heal us. Unite us. And protect us. 
Let's pray. Let's pray for revival and renewal. Let's gather together. Let's pray in the parking lot of the Freeman Coliseum on the evenings of August 9th and 16th. Let's park and pray. It's time, don't you think? We face so many challenges. COVID-19, unemployment, and racism. Estamos en un tiempo sin precedente y necesitamos hacer oración sin precedente. So let's come together and bow down before God. This is the command in scripture. When the land was suffering from severe famine, God told his people to call a solemn assembly. Blow the trumpet in Zion. That's what prayer is. We're blowing the trumpet in Zion. Consecrate a fast. Call a solemn assembly. Gather the people. Consecrate the congregation. Assemble the elders. And gather the children, even the nursing infants. Let the bridegroom leave his room and the bride her chamber. Let the priests, the ministers of the Lord, weep and say, Spare your people, O Lord. Joel 2, verses 15 through 17. A solemn assembly is not a concert. It's not a normal kind of meeting. It's not a preaching time. It's not a political event. This is a gathering for prayer. Escucharemos las escrituras. And ask God to hear us. He's promised to do so. If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek myself and turn from their wicked ways. Yo le escucharé desde el cielo, perdonaré su pecado y restauraré su tierra. This is our heart, to humble ourselves, repent and pray. We will observe the rules and the policies uh, during this pandemic, social distancing, masks. You can remain in your car if you would like. We will communicate by FM station radio. We will be careful. And we will be hopeful. We will stand on the promise of Acts 3, 19. Repent therefore and turn back that your sins may be blotted out, that times of refreshing may come in the presence of the Lord. Tiempos de renovación es algo que todos deseamos y necesitamos. Y vamos a levantar nuestra voz como una iglesia en San Antonio. The evening of August 9th and 16th, Freeman Coliseum. If you feel called to come, please reserve a place by registering online. If you feel called to pray but need to stay at home, you can participate by logging in at www.praysa.org. May God hear our prayers.